bring her flowers and write her notes and surprise her with presents. It's just not on a certain day, you know, any afternoon, all afternoons. Uh, write a poem for her, even if you can't write a poem. Take her for a walk in nature and hold her hand. It's Think of it that way. Men bring romance, women bring sex. How can she be there for him in a way that he is feeling like a guy? And how can he be there in a way where she feels treasured and adored? Welcome back to the Better Than Rich show. You are in for a treat today with Marsha Martin. Marsha is globally known as an executive trainer and life coach, and you might know her as one of the first 20 people who ever went through the landmark. Remember landmark? You know, landmark that's influenced millions and millions of people. She's one of the first 20 people to go through that program. And we go behind the scenes of how she's worked with Tony Robbins, Jack Canfield, uh, some, some of the greats. Uh, who've ever been in the personal growth space, uh, Don, Mig- Don Ru- Miguel Ruiz of the Four Agreements. I mean, she goes through uh, her relationships and how she established these relationships with these people, how she's worked behind the scenes in their companies. She's personally trained over 300,000 individuals around the world. Uh, some of the clients that she's having a chance to work with include Warner Brothers, Capital One, Lowe's Hotels, McCain Foods, Hard Rock Hotels International, Avion Water, Intercontinental Hotels, Dan and Yogurt, the list goes on and on of the people and the companies that she's been able to chance to connect with and work with. Uh, we have such a fun conversation. She has great analogies, especially the river analogy as she uses it uh, uh, around flows through life. I really love that our conversation around relationships, masculine, feminine energy, creating polarity in a relationship. Um, yeah, you're you're in for a treat. So get ready for Marsha Martin. So welcome back to the Better Than Rich show. I'm your host today, Mike Abramowitz, and I am here with Marsha Martin. And obviously, you just heard me talk about how awesome she is. I mean, you're talking 300,000 individuals around the globe, a prominent leader, someone that you definitely want to learn from. And uh, I'm really excited to have you on the show. So welcome to the Better Than Rich show, Marsha. Thank you, Mike. I'm really, really thrilled to be here. I love how you show up. You look fantastic with your Leadership Academy shirt on your four clovered uh, leaf hat. So it's fun to be here. Wonderful. Hey, I am. A, I'm very much a hats and t-shirt kind of guy. And, uh, you know, I, I had someone reach out to me recently trying to sell me like men's clothing, <laughs> uh, like a direct sales thing. And I'm like, Unless you got t-shirts and hats, like I don't know, I don't know if I'm your target audience over here. I'm like a basketball shorts t-shirt kind of guy, but um, but yeah. So, Marsha, tell me, I, I, I'm really excited to have you on on uh, on our show and 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 be able to get you exposed to our audience. And you have a lot of really great accolades, but I'd like to know a little bit more about you as a person. Then we're going to get into the human potential movement and how it started. And I'd really love to hear a little bit more about like. What is, um, you know, what, it, what our audience, if they don't know who Marsha is, what are some things that are really be important for them to know about you? Well, I think I'm a lot of fun and I love animals and uh, I love mm. being with friends and traveling. I travel all over the world. I love adventure and discovery and learning new things. And I love learning Mm. myself, you know, just like continually growing. I think that that's a really important thing for a human being to do. And I'm a very loyal friend. Would you say the learning is something that has been a part of you and a part of your life since like you were young? Or do you feel like that happened later in life? And I asked that because me, I failed reading when I was in middle school because I hated reading. Uh, I just didn't like it. Uh, it was, it was uh, just one of those things like the books weren't interesting to me. But now uh, this year, I read over 6,000 pages. So it's like, you know, it's one of those things that are learned. So when it comes to learning, developing, self-development, just growing yourself, uh, where, 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 where was like the birthplace for you where you're like, dang, okay, this learning thing is pretty important. For I me. think it started when I was a real wee child because my father was an alcoholic and kind of a lost human being. And he used to always lose his job 
also because he didn't like to be bossed around or told what to do. And so someday he would always say something that he shouldn't have. And then he would lose his job and he would come home that day and say, we have to move. And so most of my young life was spent going from school to school to school. I went to two or three schools a year until I was a sophomore in high school. And what would happen is because it was so great at school and that's where life was good, that's where it was fun, that's where it was safe. And so I think that, you know, part of my uh, survival mechanism was to continue to learn. And then that also endeared me to my teachers. And so I became teacher's pet sort of, or most popular student and those kinds of things. And so a lot of my activity in life was around education, around growing and around mentors that acknowledged me and appreciated me for that. So it's been there for a long time. Mm. That's beautiful. And, 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 and catch me up to speed on this as far as going from this avid, you know, teacher's pet learner into turning this into a, a platform. I mean, you have a really beautiful platform that serves hundreds of thousands of people across the world. Uh, in fact, if, I, if I'm not mistaken, you correct me if I'm wrong, Landmark, you were a part of the Landmark Forum before Landmark was Landmark, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? I worked in New Werner Earhart before we started EST, Earhart Seminars Training, which became mm. Landmark Forum. I took Werner's very first training. He'd never done any trainings ever. And there were 20 of us in that first workshop. And from that moment, he mm. asked me to be part of the team. And there were about five of us, mostly women, that built EST. And I was the senior vice president for 10 years from the inception of EST, which happened after I came to work for Werner, um, until 10 years later. And so I started with 20 people as graduates, and we ended up with millions and millions worldwide. And mostly that was my job to fill trainings. I was in charge of communication, mm -hmm. registration, and uh, production. So my job was to fill the trainings, train the trainers in sales and presentation skills, and handle all the enrollment and sales and marketing and PR for the EST organization, which, as you said, became Landmark. And I mean, landmark for for a listener. If you're if you're here, if you're a listener right now, landmark. You you probably have heard of it. I mean, it is a it is the largest. Uh, you know, anytime I hear landmark, I I'm a big Tony Robbins guy, so I'm like, yeah, there's like landmark, and then there's like Tony Robbins, and it's like these are two big giant personal growth arenas for people that serve the millions. And you're talking that you started <laughs> when there was like 20 people, yeah. like. That's that's really remarkable. I, I am so interested in what have you what are some of the things you experienced? I mean, the people that have come through landmark, the you know, between the relationships, the people, the topics, the the growth of that organization. I'm I'm sure there's tons of lessons. And I would love to kind of pick that apart just a smidge if you're willing to talk about that. Would that be all sure. right? Well, what's really interesting so, is that when I left EST, after 10 years, I was quite famous. People would stop me on the street in New York and ask for my autograph, literally. And, you know, because I was mm. the face of EST, because I was in charge of enrollment and sales. So I was always the one that introduced Werner at the big special events. We started off by leading guest seminars and talking to guests in the bedroom of a, an apartment condo. And Werner would teach the graduates in a circle on the floor in the living room. And then I would take the guests into the bedroom and I would sit on the dresser and they would sit on the bed. And then I would tell them about the training and enroll them into it. And that turned into then we did hotel rooms and then we did auditoriums at hotels and conventions. And then we did like the cow palace with 20,000 people. It was my job to fill it and produce it um, and train the people how to organize it and, um, you know, do the logistics in it and train the speakers how to speak at it and all of those things. So it was quite extraordinary lessons learned all the way through. But interesting, when I left EST, because I was so well known at what I had done and taking along with Werner and helping him and the other executives to create that incredible organization to the place that we did, 
a lot of other leaders came to me to ask me to work with them, one of which was Tony Robbins. And so I ran Tony Robbins' mm. company for two years in the mid-'80s and helped take him national. He was on the West Coast at the time, and I helped him train all of his enrollment and um, staff and team in communication and leadership and sales and public speaking. So I know Tony very well. That's very cool. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I have more follow up questions. So I'm not, I'm, we're, we're not done with this conversation, Marcia. So, so if any of, if any of the listeners uh, have never heard of Warner, would, what would you say to them? How would you educate them about, you know, what that you know what they should know what would somebody want what, what what would you say about that um i would say well first of all werner was from my point of view a genius and a very committed person about human beings and humanity going to the next level and in fact the purpose of the training when we started us was to transform your experience so that the situations that come up just in the process of living clear up just in the process of living itself. But we had an internal purpose for the team and the staff. And we were very committed to that purpose. And this will tell you a bit about Warner because this is what he shared with us, our purpose was, which was to create a critical mass of consciousness on the planet so that a turning could take place. And the turning, as Gene mm. Houston talks about it, is like in the ocean, when the tide turns, it starts at the bottom. So you don't really see it, but there is a point where it turns to where you see it at the top, and that is the critical mass or the tipping point. And so it was our purpose really to wake people up and to have them realize that they had the capacity to be responsible for their lives. They weren't a victim of a circumstance, and their circumstances didn't provide them with their power that there was an internal kind of beingness a human being could connect with and come from and speak into existence the things that they wanted to create in life so that their their commitment caused a circumstance rather than a circumstance determining what they should be committed to. And most people, even mm. today, not most people, but many people still look at life that way. If you ask them, are they committed? They will say, well, wait a minute. Before I tell you I'm committed, let me check to see if the circumstances are right. Do I have enough money? Do I have the right team? Do I have the right talent? Whereas the people who really make a difference in life understand that first is the stand. They, they take a stand. It's a commitment. They say, this shall be. And they come from their internal power and they say, this is where I'm taking a stand and I'm going to be unreasonable about it and it shall happen. And from that kind of consciousness, what we've discovered is that circumstances really align themselves around you and get to a point where you actually create the circumstances you need to deliver on the commitment that you've made. So to me, that's what Werner has always been about and what he taught me and what I thought, I think that he really brought to the world. Mm. And, and how does someone muster up the courage to take a stand amidst their circumstances? Because you said you had circumstances with your dad growing up and, and sometimes it's tough to take that stand. Sometimes it's tough to have the courage to do so because the circumstances, what other people might think or what loved ones might say, or what if I'm not good enough, I'm inadequate. Like, how does someone muster up that courage to take that stand? Well, that's the key, isn't it? For you to find that part of yourself where you actually are connected to something of a higher power than just your small limitations, and that from that higher place, if you flow that through you and you come from that place, you can cause miracles. And you're not the victim of a circumstance. And most people learn that through crisis. You know, something will be so horrible in their life, it'll break down. And they will go through that place in consciousness where they say, okay, I'm just going to surrender. You know, <laughs> I don't know what else to do except... And then they find that place inside of them where they can act into the world instead of the world acting on them. 
and that's a change in consciousness. And I feel my life has been so unique because from the very early time of when I was a teenager, I've had mentors that taught me those kinds of, of concepts, that taught me that kind of ability. My aunt was a clairvoyant um, shaman, teacher, and, and healer and an esoteric astrologist. And I interned with her from the time I was around 17 or 18. And so I learned about how the dream world works and how energy works and how you can cause things, create things, manifest things, rather than being at the effect of your circumstances. So when I met Werner, when I was in my very early 20s, you know, it seemed natural that that should be the next step of learning more about my own power and my own ability to be responsible. So I think the best example of having the courage to take a stand is those divers in Acapulco, Mexico, that are on the cliffs. And when they dive down into the ocean from that high point, they actually have to look down and see the boulders and the rocks, if they dove when they could see the ocean below them, by the time that they reached the water, the sea would go out, the tide would go out, and they would hit the rocks. So, you know, you have to have that ability to dive into the unknown and to take a risk and to go for it, trusting it's going to work out and the tide's going to come in, it's going to meet you when you hit the water. Mm. Uh, that that is um what 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 it strikes with me is I, I actually just had a conversation with uh with someone today about uh three things when it comes to trusting themselves. And that's why I wanted to hear your take. And I love I love the analogy of the diver, by the way. That's I haven't heard that one. I really love that. I may even steal that if <laughs> yes, that's okay. Um so <laughs> um but what I said was uh, to the to this individual that when when it comes to making a decision, we want to number one be able to uh, trust our intuition that we wouldn't make this decision out of um, you know if we didn't have some sort of trust, some sort of faith. So we want to trust the intuition. Then number two is we also want to have intelligence to know that we're, even if I made the quote unquote wrong decision, I will learn something from this because I'm an intelligent human. And then number three is. I have enough resilience to recover from whatever decision I make if it wasn't the decision I wanted. So as long as I have enough trust, as long as I have enough resilience, and if I have enough, um, uh, the, the, the second one that I'm, I'm slipping my mind, trust, resilience, and, uh, and, and intelligence, uh, as, I, as I take my own advice, right? Uh, so... <laughs> That's what I. That's that's what's been serving me in the past, and I love what you said about how you can, um, how you can muster up the courage to take a stand for yeah. for having this trust. That's like, yeah, it, it could work out. You need a little bit of faith to see beyond the now, and um, I really love that. So thank you so much for sharing yeah. uh, about Werner. And I, I, ha I have to ask, go ahead if there's no, something else um, you want to share on I that. I think please. also it helps with that particular question or conversation that we're in if you understand the laws and how things work. So if you think about mm. a river and you're going down the river in a little boat, and the river has its own dimensions, its own nature, its own, it is the river, and you don't have any control over the river. But what you do have control over is how you're going to stand in the boat going down the river. Now, the river may have turbulence, or it may be totally no wind, and so it's totally still, or there may be rapids, or there may be great drop-offs. And, and you can't change that. People try to change the river or they try to change their circumstances or they try to change the person that they're dealing with or they try to change the event that they're in rather than realizing they can only choose how to respond to it. It's going to be the way that it is. And when you realize that's the way it is, then you start putting your focus and your attention on the things that you talked about, which is what I call being centered. And being centered is present, open, and connected. So if I can be in present time, not think about the past or worried about the future or caught up in my emotions and in my head, 
if I can be open to the possibility of things rather than closed and closed down and cautious, cautious and, and, you know, reticent. And if I can be connected, if I can come from the place that I realize I'm connected to all of it, so there's a flow. You know, the same source that makes the river makes me. And everything is connected. If I can come from that understanding, then I don't resist what's happening. I begin to flow with it. And so when you put your attention on getting back to center before you choose an action to take, then the action that you take is is more productive because you're not caught up in your automatic behaviors and your old decisions and your, you know, emotions that are running you. You're centered, open, present, and connected. Now I choose, okay, maybe I don't have all the choices in the world. Maybe if I'm in prison, I can't choose to be here or not. But I can choose how I'm going to respond to this particular way it is to this event, to this person, to this circumstance. And that's what I think you're saying. You're saying get centered first and then come from your own ability to choose a productive way to move forward. And then the other thing I would say is if people understand how things are created, most people think that you create something. If you want to be something, you have to have something and do something first. So if I want to be a dancer, first I have to go out and get some money and buy an outfit and then get a trainer and a teacher and, you know, practice, practice, practice and get some music. So these are the things I need to have and these are the things I need to do and then I can be a dancer. But the way things really work is it's always the dream is first. Of everything that exists in reality, a dream of it happens first. It has to exist on the inner world before it can exist in the outer world. So if you understand that, then you realize your commitment comes first because it is the dream of what you're going to create. It is the stand. It is your feelings. It's all of the things on the inner world. I shall. I will. And then from there, human beings are congruent. And what congruency means is that things line up. So if you are being a certain commitment, what will happen is you will act in a certain way and speak in a certain way in terms of the alignment of that commitment. And if everything is lined up the way you're being and what you're doing, you will automatically have whatever you created as a dream. The only variable is time. So if you understand how things come into existence, then of course you say, okay, I'm going to get committed first rather than trying to go around and figure out what I need in terms of circumstances. And then if you can have the metaphor of the river and just be be clear, it's just get yourself straightened up in the boat. Don't worry about the river. You can't change the river. But, you know, then you'll be in this flow. And in the flow, it's like surfing. You know, sometimes waves are high and sometimes waves are low, but you don't have time when you're surfing to make it wrong or right or complain about it or cry about it. you got to hold on to the surfboard <laughs> and get to the shore. So you got to stay present time. And if you go under, you just come back up. You don't say, oh, I'm so unhappy I didn't make it. No, you, you know, you need to be where you are when you're there and go with the flow. And I think that that river analogy kind of allows you to do that. Mm. Oh, my gosh. That was so great, Marsha. <laughs> what an awesome analogy. The river analogy is fantastic. Uh, I, I really love that explanation a ton. And and in, it reminded me we had uh, two, two guests on the show, Dr. Kelly Flanagan and also David Lee. And they talked a little bit about the the masculine and the feminine, where it's masculine, let's go in this direction, and the feminine, let's just really go with the flow. And using that surfing analogy that you that you that you ended with, it kind of got me thinking. It's like the shore is a masculine, we're going that directionally, and then it's that feminine. It's like let's also be present with our surfboard in these waves, and not let's let's not fight what <laughs> is. Uh, and I'm assuming you have some really great wisdom that that is underneath that umbrella of the the presence between and the dance between that masculine and feminine. It's one of the topics I love to talk about. I've I've asked several guests around this. Ben Bukolsky was on the show, former Mr. Canada Canada bodybuilder. And I like to ask this question, um, but I don't know if I asked this question to a female yet. (laughs) So 
let's talk, let me ask you, let's ask the question of like, what is your, how would you define or how do you describe polarities or masculine feminine just in general for ourselves? Uh, and then if it, if it makes sense and it's a line, we could even talk about it in, in a relationship too. But uh, that's, that's what I, what I started thinking about, about this being presence while also having some sort of direction with ourselves mask and feminine is what showed up for me. So I'm curious, let me toss it to you. What, what is your, how do you define those polarities, the energies that go behind those? You know, I'd love to hear your take. Wow. That's a big question, but I love this question. And I love about relationships too. And I love about the feminine and the masculine and where I come from is we all have feminine and masculine, but we're an expression at this moment as a woman, I'm more of an expression of the feminine but it's not that I don't have a masculine energy. Of course, there is that energetic combining that makes the two pieces together make the whole. Um, I find that it works best if I think about it this way, that a feminine energy is an appetite. It's, um, it's like, I want this and I want this and I want this and I want this. And I can create and I can consider this as possible. And a masculine energy is I can produce that. So what I tell men and women in terms of relationships is if a woman can get really clear on what she wants and realize that she deserves it and make clear what she wants and let the guy know what she wants, a guy naturally wants to produce it. You know, that's what men do. They fix it. They produce it. They focus on it. They get an answer. And so, but if they don't know what they're producing, it's kind of like, well, how do I get this done if I don't even know what it is? And women are not really careful to be clear about what they want or even know what they want or especially even think they deserve what they want. So their appetite is small when their appetite should be big. And then to believe in your man that he can produce it instead of producing it for him. Because women, as we know, are very good at multitasking. So I can create what I want and then I can go get it. But that's not any fun. I'd rather create what I want and then have somebody help me go get it. And it's that that dance back and forth. But I think that, you know, it's not just that one is all of it and another is the other part it's we're all both parts and we express that particular kind of energy more in a more dominant way usually one from the other and with the woman using the women example of uh getting clear of what they want how might a woman get clear of what she wants if hypothetically she is uh, surrounded by, um, you know, the circumstance and everything. I know we, we kind of already talked about it, but what what specific to a woman getting clear of what she wants so she could effectively communicate that to a man? Because I think if I'm I, I'm not questioning, I, I'm not a woman, so I can't answer them. That's why I'm asking you. But I would think that there would be almost like this. Um, uh, like it would take a vulnerability that like, what if I say this is what I want and he can't satisfy those needs. And then I feel, I feel like he might not be the one, or maybe there's something wrong with me. And like, it can kind of create even almost like a downward cycle for the woman. If she was vulnerable enough to say, this is what I want. And I would love for you to help me get there. And then it's like, Oh no, he can't help me get there. Um, well, I don't know. Maybe there's something you can speak to on that potentially. Well, I think that, and now you're getting into some of my perspectives. So first of all, I want to explain. Yeah. Tell me all, tell, tell me them all. I want to hear them all. First of all, <laughs> I have to give a little caveat, which is um, perspective is really important where you see from, because it causes what is out there for you to show up or occur. So for example, you know those pictures where you look at it one way and there's one thing and you look at it a different way and there's another? Like I know of one picture mm -hmm. where, you know, you look at it this way and there's this beautiful young woman. But if you just kind of move your perspective a bit and look at it differently, there's an old hag. Have you ever seen one of those kinds of pictures? 
Yeah, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey, uh, yes, that first yes, chapter. Yes, it's in the yeah. Stephen Covey book, that exact picture. Okay, so here's how I mm-hmm. use that as a metaphor. In life, everything exists. Just like when you look at that picture, they're both there. They both exist. However, one only shows up for you from a certain perspective at any one moment. So if I look from this perspective, this will occur or this will show up. If I change my perspective, something else will occur or will show up. So it's important to choose perspectives that produce the things in life that are occurring for you that work to produce the things you want. So, for example, you look out in life and everything is there. What is abundant and what is scarce? What is working and what is not working? It's not like one is there and one isn't. They're both there. But what shows up for you? Well, it depends on where you're looking from. Are you the kind of person that is a half glass, glass half empty or a glass half full kind of person? Do you look from the point of view of looking to see what's working first? or from the point of view of being critical and judgmental, and so then you see everything that's wrong. So it's important. So now to the thing about relationships or men and women. I have a perspective that seems to work. I'm not saying... Mm. Tell me, tell me more, Marcia. It's true. I don't know if it's true, but it's worked better than any other perspective. In other words, if I consider it this way, my relationships seem to work better. Okay, with the opposite sex mm. or, you know, with with people in general. And, and what I notice is that there are motivations that we all have. And from a woman, usually the motivation comes from a fear of not being attractive enough. Now, I have an interesting point of view on this, too, because most women think, oh, I'm not sure I'm attractive. Oh, am I attractive enough? Or is she more attractive than me? Or, you know, it's a fear of, well, maybe I'm not enough, which is why I find it's hard for women to tell you what they want, because they don't even think they deserve whatever they want. So they just want little things. But this attractive is not what it appears to be. Most women think it's about well, what does my hair look like and do I have the right makeup and am I the right weight and blah, blah, blah. I think it's about how are you able to attract? What's your capacity to call towards you the things that you want? Are you attracting, not so much attractive, but attractive in the way that I would say, is your nature open enough to see that you have the power to call something towards you? And that's what I feel women have the power to do. Their natural nature is to call. Men's natural nature is to respond. So, you know, we can look at a lot of different things. You know, there's the there's spider and the fly. There's the essence. And, you know, you're attracted to a scent. But I look at it from that way. Do I, do I think it's that way? I don't know. I just find if I look at it the way it seems to work better. So I consider, okay, I can call towards me. I have the power to attract. And my fear or my motivation is going to be that I need to handle as a limiting belief is I'm not attractive enough. So when I get caught up in that, I remind myself that, you know, I can, I can attract what I want. I'm okay. This is fine. I'm worthwhile. I deserve this, and I work on that piece of me. What I find with men is their fear or their motivation is, can I be successful? Am I going to be able to produce? Will I get it done? And and you see a lot of men that they wait to start. You know, and I think part of it is, and I don't know if this is really true. I'm just saying I use this as a perspective, and it seems to work, that I kind of deal with men as if they might be concerned whether they're going to be successful. So the way I deal with a man as a woman is I don't help them because that would castrate them. That would prove to them that they can't get it done if I do it for them. So what I do instead is I believe in them. I put something out that I want. And if my guy says, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I would say, honey, I know you can. I believe in you until that part of him is assuaged to the point where 
is willing to try. And boy, you know, you tell a man how great he is about what he did, and he'll want to do more of that. So I just think any human being can do anything. It's the fear that's in the way. So a woman can have a bit, let's go and talk about an appetite for a minute. Now, women seem to me, at least I talk to my girlfriends and they tell me, well, I don't know if I should want that. And I'm not sure if I, I can have that. And so I feel like appetite is like a muscle. You got to get it going. You, you know, it's not important what you want in the beginning. It's important that you can want something. And so I give my women an, an, an um, exercise. I say, okay, sit down and for 30 minutes, I'm going to time you. I just want you to make a list of everything that you want. And and like yeah. after two or three minutes, they stop and they go, I'm not sure. I'm not sure because they're judging themselves. And I, I get them to the point where instead of figuring out, is this really what I want? Because that's what they're looking at for. I get them just to get eased into wanting. And it's like starting a motor. Okay, now that you can want something. And if you can sit down for a half an hour and just draw out everything I want, I want, I want, I want, I want, we've got an appetite motor going. Now you can say, okay, what's really important to me? What do I really want? And when you're clear about it and you can share that with someone, um, even whether it's a man or a woman, but you can share it with the person that you care about in a way that's attractive. Women tend to be bitchy and angry a lot sooner than they should. You know, it's never good to be a bitch. The fear of being a bitch to a guy is much, much more powerful than when you're actually the bitch. So, you know, it's in an attractive way. Can you clearly share what it is that you want and come from a place that you deserve it? And then can you let your guy do it? Can you let him take as long as he takes if he takes longer than you would have? Can you let him, you know, do it in a way that is not quite as complete as you would have done it at first and, and let him go and believe in himself? Then eventually that teamwork starts working. And, and I have found that when women are clear and attractive and loving and um, about what they want and they're clear with their guys, guys will do anything to give it to them. How, how might a woman be okay receiving? Uh, you know, is there, you know, how do they strengthen that relationship? I have more questions and, and that was like amazing, but you just triggered that question. And before I go back to everything else that you just said. So what was the question now you want me to explore? How, 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 how might they, how might a woman uh, be open to receiving? Like, yeah receiving like letting him do it because that's uh, that's letting go of that control and and uh, in our environment in our society uh women are like the bosses of the household a lot of times the boss you know the bosses of their business the bosses of their jobs the bosses of the parenting right so they put on so many masks of masculinity because they have to be in the masculine energy where it's hard to it's hard to just let him do it it's hard to receive sometimes well here's the deal i don't think masculinity is about being the boss I think it's about being the boss the way that you are. Are you the boss in a feminine way or are you the boss in a masculine way? And a masculine expression of being in control or giving an order or an instruction or guiding someone or mentoring someone is going to be different than a feminine energetic kind of vibration. And I think that women mm. tend to think they have to be a man when they're the boss, because it's been told to us that, you know, when you're the boss, you're masculine. And no, when you're the boss, it just means you're in charge of producing the result and that you are the manager of it. And so you can do that in a masculine way or a feminine way. I think with a woman, though, the thing that she needs to, most of my girlfriends that I think about that I've worked with over years, and this has taken years and years and years for me to learn, too, is that we have to be willing to allow someone else to do it for us. And we're so, we've been told so much unconsciously from the time that we're little that we're not worthwhile. We're not as good as a man. Uh, it's a man's world. Uh, what we want is really secondary. We should want um, dolls and not fame, or we should want this and not that. 
uh, we, you know, boys can't cry, but girls can. So, you know, we can be weak. So we must be weak. All of, there's so much going on that says we're the inferior sex. And, you know, as a woman who's been in the boardroom my whole life, I never really noticed it because I just was accepted by everybody. But boy, there have been some organizations I've been a part of where there was a real boys club. And I thought, whoa, this is what people are talking about. Suddenly, Mm -hmm. I can't train the CEO because I'm a woman. I have to train the director of HR. You know, those little kinds of, oh, yeah, mm-hmm. well, we'll take care of the CEO and vice president and the executive of sales, but you, you know, you take care of the, <laughs> okay. It, it's an interesting kind of thing. So we don't really know how worthwhile we are. And then when we find out when we're worthwhile, we don't have a lot of models to be able to express that in a feminine, nurturing way. We think that we have to take on a man's way to tell somebody what to do and be a boss that way. So, you know, there's a lot Mm. of stuff going on. This is a special time in history. Oh my gosh. This is all the, everybody's been talking about this for thousands of years, this particular time in history. This is the age of Aquarius. This is the age when it's happening or not. This is the age where the indigenous uh, tribes say the eagle and the condor is going to fly wingtip to wingtip across the rainforest or not the condor being nature and the ego being, you know, uh, masculinity and the mind and all of that kind of stuff. How do we bring those two energies together in a way that is cooperative? And it's not a guaranteed thing that it's going to work out. There's a lot going on right now. Well, well, it starts with conversations like this. I mean, it it is when, when we can look at it from the lens of what you're saying, because it is, you you can see uh, I'm I'm, re- I'm reading a book called The Boy Crisis, so I'm looking at it from the the boys' lens, where I want to see both. Of course, I want to see both lenses because it is it's like this this polarity of toxic on both ends or wounded on both ends is really tough to bring a centered conversation around without like getting triggered of like you know it's uh, using the, the 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 famous word that happens all the time right now is triggered. I really love what you said, though, is because how can you lead or be in charge or be in power from the nurture state? And sometimes that's tough. Where my curiosity went is parenting because we have a two year old and it's like it's sometimes is, you know, when you're parenting, you can nurture so much. But then sometimes it's like, no, stop right? Sit. Like there needs to be that direction. And then it's all, oh, that's coddle. So this like balance of the two, this takes a a, a fair amount of self-awareness to put down one and, and call the next one forward, especially if as a man to put down the masculine and pick up the feminine. And I'm assuming for the woman to put down the feminine and call the masculine or vice versa. Like it's it's it is very interesting from from a parenting perspective and then also from an intimate perspective too where it's like you've been i've been in this in charge role all day calling the shots and now it's like i don't really care where we go for dinner like i don't want to call the shot right now and it's like now i got to keep calling the shots and keep making decisions i don't want to make decisions right now uh so mm-hmm. it, it does take this dance of self awareness yeah. Um, and having conversations about it because we sometimes are thinking thoughts that aren't ours. It's societal conversations of boys don't cry. And, you know, that means if you cry, you're weak. And, but it's okay if you would cry if you're a girl, because that means you're weak. Like that sucks. Like that, that is a, that was a really great, profound statement there because uh, I, that is not the truth. <laughs> you know, like it's not the truth at all. Uh, in fact, I was, I was, I talked to some of my clients and I'm like, when's the last time you cried? Now I'll ask a guy, that's all a girl this too. It's like, when's the last time you cried? It's like one of the guys had uh, uh, Easter weekend. He said this to me last week. I said, you remember like the specific time it was Easter weekend? I was like, well, right now it's December. So you specifically remember the last time you cried was Easter? So I'm like, I, was like, I was like, my goodness, that's well, number one, good job for remembering. Number two, let's cry right now, dude. Like, what do I need to say to you to let, let this emotion out? You know, so 
Uh, but I, I think this is good. So let me kick it to you. Well, what's showing up uh, sure. you know, on my little rant yes, here? Yes, I love this things. because I want to just add another dimension into it. But I love this conversation. Please. I could talk about this for, you know, and I do usually in my workshops. So <laughs> first of all, women think and men think, I think also, that there is something a man's supposed to do and something a woman's supposed to do. So when I tell my women, you know, figure out something that you want, they think that there are certain things they're supposed to want from their guy. Like they're supposed to want him to support them. They're supposed to want him to bring home the bacon or the money. They're supposed to want him to be the strong person in the relationship, whatever. Like, well, that they can want those things if they do, but if they don't, they shouldn't want them. And we're stuck in this place where a man thinks he has to do this and a woman is supposed to do this and you're supposed to, you know. So when, when a woman really gets that there are certain things she wants from her man and not necessarily um, does she need other things that she would rather give herself because she feels she could do a better job of it or it would be less high maintenance or whatever for her to do it she shouldn't ask that of what her man is going to give her you got to find the need for the guy you're with you've got to find something that you really want from him and i think that women think they're supposed to want money and they're supposed to want this and they're supposed to want that and i don't think that that's all that they really want they want care and nurturing and love and attention and uh tenderness and there's all sorts of things that you could ask a man for that has nothing to do with will you provide for me now if you want to be provided for yeah. then ask for that but i i think it's important that a man doesn't think he has to give it because he's a man or a woman feels that she has to ask for it because she's the woman. You know, it's like I can I can think of a lot of things I want from a man and it's not to take care of me. I don't need anybody to take care of me. I, I've done a pretty good job taking care of me. But I do want some conversation and some touching and some loving and some acknowledgement and, you know, the dinner every once in a while would be nice. Do you, think, do you see what I'm saying? It's like, I think that there was stuck in this role models of what we should be giving. You know, like a man shouldn't necessarily have to be at work all day making the decisions and then come home and do the dishes or take care of the baby with the woman. Maybe she should go out and get a job herself and could bring home more money and he should stay home and take care of the baby and he would be more happy. I don't know. But it's not so in stone these models that we're supposed mm. to be because we're a man or because we're a woman. It's what do we want? What works for us? And what can we contribute? And, and what does one, you know, feel competent about giving? There's, there's many things to take into consideration. Yeah. And Marsha, those presuppositions going into the relationship is where a lot of the tension lives yeah. inside that relationship because it's like, I'm bringing mine, you're bringing yours. And then it's like the relationship is built on presuppositions versus what is actual, actually real. And that's why I love the exercise that you said. Woman sits down for 30 yeah. minutes, write down all your yeah. wants. I am curious, what's what's the exercise for a man? Is that the same thing or is it a different uh, is it different? Because if, if a, a woman is... is to call, like to call on things or to receive certain things and do this exercise of what are my wants, what would be the man's to respond to them or, or to, um, to call out some of his, um, gifts or whatever it might be. I'm curious. Well, you're going to laugh at this because when I go into organizations, you know, I have lots of corporate clients, um, corporate clients that I've had are Hyatt hotels, intercontinental hard rock hotels, Warner brothers, Avion water, Dan and yogurt, capital one, you know, top executive. So a few, a few, a few small well, companies that you've, uh, you know, worked usually, with. <laughs> usually I'll go in and do a, a retreat, an executive retreat and teach leadership and communication and presentation skills and, you know, how one builds a strong team. And so I'll take maybe 100 executives or 30 executives or the 15 top senior VPs or whatever it is that they want me to work with, and I'll have them for two or three days. 
Well, what happens is after those two or three days, a lot of the senior executives come to me individually and say, you know, can I have you as a coach? You know, you know what, how you think and what you did. And, you know, you just you made it all so amazing. I changed so much. I would like to spend some individual time with you. So we start coaching and it's always this way. We'll go for a few months and it'll be coaching about the team, coaching about their profession, coaching about their leadership skills. And at some point, whether it's four, five, six months in, usually if it's a guy, the guy will come to me and will kind of be embarrassed and say, okay, I have something I, I'd like you to coach me on, but I'm not sure if it's okay. And I go, well, what is it? Knowing, I already know what it is because it's happened so many times. And they'll go, I really need help with my wife. I really need help with my <laughs> you know, I really need help with my children. Um, and so I start talking to them about that particular relationship. And with the guys, I always start with, you're not giving enough affection because a woman wants that. And a guy is kind of like, she wants to hear he loves her, for example. And But three or four or five times a day isn't enough for a woman. She forgets one instant after you tell her, and then she needs to hear it again. And a guy goes, well, I told her I loved her last month. Well, I, to I brought her a gift for her anniversary. <laughs> you know, and so I always have the guys, I go, okay, in the middle of a meeting, I want you to call your lady and tell her that you just had to tell her this, that you were thinking of her and, oh my God, you were thinking of her inner thigh. And, you know, it made you so hot and horny that you had to call and tell her that you loved her. Now, what really happens is they actually do this. And pretty soon the women come to me at the different, you know, organizational parties and they say, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> he did, but he's changed so much. It was so amazing, you know, and they, and the guys come back and they say, she was a little, uh, she was a little suspicious. Like, how come I'm doing this? But I say, okay, we'll just keep doing it. Just keep telling her, call her in the middle of the day, tell her that you, um, because a woman's fear, she's not attractive enough. And so when you're off to work all day, it seems like work is more attractive to you than her. Do you see? Mm -hmm. So you've got to understand mm -hmm. the motivation and the fears, whereas um, a woman is afraid, or a man is afraid he can't do it. So a, a, a woman... Don't give him a job and then take it away from him and do it for him. And always acknowledge whatever you ask him to do. Make sure he knows that you notice he did it. He did it great. He was fantastic. He was amazing. Because then he'll want to do more of that for you and he'll get better at doing the things you want him to do. So it's those little mm. things. So that's what I tell men. I say, you know, find more surprises where you can be romance. Relationships to me, the perspective I've taken on that I think works better than any other I've thought of is it's a poker table. Men bring romance and women bring sex. Women stop having headaches. Stop it. You know, a woman can get turned on with just herself saying it's time to get turned on. She doesn't need anything. A, a guy doesn't turn a woman on. A woman turns herself on with her own intention. That's what women do. So, you know, turn yourself on and get sexy. And a guy, bring romance. Bring her flowers and write her notes and surprise her with presents. It's just not on a certain day. You know, any afternoon, all afternoons. Uh, write a poem for her, even if you can't write a poem. Take her for a walk in nature and hold her hand. It's Think of it that way. Men bring romance, women bring sex. How can she be there for him in a way that he is feeling like a guy? And how can he be there in a way where she feels treasured and adored? I hope that helps. That's going to be the most listened to section. <laughs> uh, we're going to label that section of how to get laid. Uh, that's what we're going to call it. And uh, that's going to be, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to cut that one. Uh, we're going to clip that one and we're going to post that all over social. So that's perfect. Uh, Mar Marsha, I, I really love this combo. And, and I, I, I want to make sure we spend some time real quick before we head for the exits is the human potential movement. Oh, yeah. 
uh, because this is something that you have done a fantastic job with. And I'd like to just take just if you could plug it, tell us a little bit about it. What does it entail? Um, you know, how just just any anything that we can know about the human potential move movement that's helped inspired hundreds of thousands of people at this point. Well, you know, the human potential movement was really a time in 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 history too. So in the late '60s and the early '70s, and it was in a place. Uh, it really came out of the hippies in San Francisco. I just happened to be in San Francisco during, you know, I saw all the rock concerts and all the greats and all the music, and I, you know, had my floppy leather hat and my guitar and my short skirts and my embroidered shirts and. Uh, we were happy and hippies and loved. And it was it was like that. And there were a lot of um, courses. It started with, like some of the early courses were um, Jose Silva's Mind Control. And then there was Alexander Everett's Mind Dynamics. And then that's what Werner took to be a trainer of Mind Dynamics before he created EST. So I took Mind Dynamics with Werner in San Francisco where he had that particular area. And then Werner brought in a lot of Dale Carnegie and some Scientology and some um, uh, uh, leadership kinds of courses um, and kind of married it with the Jose Silva and the uh, mind dynamics and all Mm. of that. And, you know, a lot of it is all of this human potential technology is thousands and thousands of years old. I mean, go back to all the great bi- mm. all the great books, including the Bible, and and all of the things that are said in all those great books are pretty much what are taught in the human potential courses. Um, mm. And then from there, you know, there was a group of trainers. There was uh, Tony Robbins came down from Jim Rohn when he when that was his mentor. Um, Jack Canfield, one of my great friends who wrote Chicken Soup from the book, was an insight trainer, and he worked with John Roger. Uh, Werner worked with uh, Alexander Everett. So there were, you know, and then there was also, um, what was the book company? Uh, Nightingale and Conant, the people that created Nightingale and Conant, they were great human potential kinds of um uh, you know, philosophy concepts, uh, think and grow rich. All of those great books are some great books out of the eighties that were 1800s that were the think and grow rich books where that came from and all of that kind of data, the law of attraction. So in the early, the late sixties, mid sixties and early seventies, there started being these courses. People started going to courses and it became a thing. And EST was one of the biggest courses there were. And in the 70s and early 80s, just like hundreds of thousands of people took EST and everybody. You know, that's how I met Jerry Weintraub and Steven Soderbergh and Nancy Pelosi and on and on and on. Um, Just, you know, and princes and governors and scientists and celebrities. It was the thing. And so what's Mm. happened since then is it's... um, it's come into its own in terms of really combining philosophy and combining psychology and combining some of the new sciences and, you know, how your brain works and neuro linguistic programming, which is Tony brought that whole thing and made it famous. He didn't create it, but he brought it to the forefront and lots of different ways where you could be a more effective human being. So, you know, it's, it's, Mm. it's been an exciting ride. I mean, I was there when there was just a few of us and then suddenly there were tens and tens and tens of thousands. Oh my God. Mm. That's really cool. I appreciate you sharing because, because that backstory, you know, you could Wikipedia something, but to have someone who's experienced it and has gone through and seen, I mean, these names, I mean, these are the legends of personal growth that you're listing off and, I mean, gosh, we have, we actually have a dream list of guests on the pod to have on the podcast. And you mentioned like a dozen of those dream guests that we have to have on the show. So, um, maybe, maybe there's a way that you can make an introduction or something, but like, these are the greatest of all time at what they do that started this movement that you were a part of and have kind of seen from, from the studs to, 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 to build in the high rise. So, um, 
Marsha, this has been awesome. We like to ask uh, three questions, but you know, ending each conversation that we have. Uh, and you could, you know, short hitting, first top of mind, whatever comes to you. Uh, the first question is, what do you think the world's need? What do you think the world needs most of today? I think the world needs consciousness. I think that people need to wake up. You know, when my friend Lynn Twist, who started the Pachamama Alliance in the early 80s, went to the rainforest because she had a, a vision and a dream, she met with the indigenous tribe of the Oshawar. And the Oshawar, she went down the Amazon and, you know, into the forest and met with the chiefs. And the chiefs said to her, you need to go back and change the dream. And she was like, what? And she'd been working in hunger because we did a lot of hunger. She was one of my early students in EST in the guest seminar leaders program. We started the hunger project there and she was a big part of that. So her work really had been hunger. So it hadn't been the environment. But after meeting with the Ashwar and having the vision that she had and the experience of talking with the chiefs, they told her, you guys have an unsustainable dream. And she said, you people of the north, that's what the chief said, um, you people of the north, meaning you civilized people, you know, you have an unsustainable dream that is going to take us to a place that's going to destroy humanity. So you need to wake up and get a new dream because the one you have isn't working. And I think that people need to realize that there, we're, we are all connected. This, this, you are part of the river. You are part of the animals. You are part of the tree. You, you, you know, we're an expression of source, and the expression is in different forms, but it comes from the same life kind of creation. And so we have to mm -hmm. take care of ourselves and our planet and wake up and be conscious about what we're doing, what we're saying, yeah. how we're treating people, how we're treating the land, how we're treating the animals. So that's what I would say the world needs most is consciousness. It's beautiful. Um, my second question, what are one to three books that you think people should read? I th definitely think everybody in the world should read Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. It's basic, basic, wonderful, wonderful. I read it at least every six months. My great friend, Don Miguel Ruiz, who wrote The Four Agreements. The Four Agreements is an amazing book. People should read that. And Lynn Twist wrote Soul of Money, and they should read that. And here's the fourth thing I think would be good for people to do. And even though I'm giving a plug to myself, I really mean this. I've spent the last few years taking all of the videos and I keep doing it on a regular basis and uploading them to my club, MarshaMartinClub.com, where you can just go in and at your own leisure for $10 a month and watch mm. workshops and, and get these kinds of conversations in your brain that wake you up. And they're fun. They're about sex. Yeah. They're about money. They're about consciousness. They're about leadership. They're about communication. So that's a, maybe a fourth book, I'll call it. A platform, Marsha Martin. Platform. Yeah, no, that's great. I was, I was gonna, I, I was leaving that at the end because when you, when I, when I saw that you offered that, I was like, we need to get our guests uh, into that club. Uh, so I'm glad you mentioned it. And 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 while we're on that, before we go to the final question, why don't we just talk about it real quick? The um that club, it's ten dollars a month. Is is that right? Yeah, it's ten dollars a month because I haven't okay. totally. It's digital library of workshops, seminars. I mean, you, you, I mean, podcast interviews. I mean, you have all of this content yep. in there. Uh, yep. And it's called the Marsha Martin Club. Where can they find that Marsha if they Martin wanted to, Club. you know, check it out? Com. And Marsha is M-A-R-C-I-A, M-A-R-T-I-N, club.com. And, you know, go in. It's cool. We'll definitely put that in the yeah, notes. Yeah. Go ahead. You can, you know, it's like a Netflix of Marsha Martin. Pick your title. Pick your workshop. <laughs> it's fun. People are getting it's a lot beautiful. of value from it. That's that's great. Thank you for sharing that, and thank you for putting that together. And um, I'm reading "Living Untethered" right now because I, I really love "Untethered Soul." So I'm reading his new one, and oh, it's like fascinating. So, uh, third question, Marcia: What does it mean to you to be better than rich? For me, it means to be awake and responsible, and to give back, to make a difference to leave something behind. 
to have my work and all the wisdom that I have and that I've gained from many, many mentors in my life that I'm so grateful for come through me that I can give away to others that they can use to have a better life. It's beautiful. Marsha. Wow. I am so honored to have you as a guest on our show. And there's so many, so many individuals that are now going to get to experience you and your wisdom that you shared. Um, I just thank you so much for your time and thank you for contributing to the episode today. So thank you for showing up. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank you for the work that you do and the opportunity that you make to create the space to bring this to people. Well done, Mike. Oh, thank you. And listener, thank you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. And listener, assuming that this episode helped you, it's your turn. Help others. Share with a friend, subscribe on YouTube, leave a rating and review on Apple and Spotify. And as always, remember to leave today better than you found it. Till next time. What's up, guys? Biggs here. I hope you enjoyed that clip. Uh, If you did, go ahead and check out the other video that's being recommended on the screen right now. You can also subscribe to our channel. And then if you really are interested in what we do, go to AutomateDelegateSystemize.com to learn more about what we're up to. Thanks again.